And in those trials, I get to have joy. Why? Because my God is bigger than the trial. My God is going to be here longer than the trial is going to be here. And then the last one, so that your joy may be complete or full. We'll go with the New Testament and the Old Testament, the King James Version and the Mike Peaceall Version. So that your joy may be complete. Remember when we talked about the vineyard and about how God wants us to produce? Why does he want us to produce fruit? So that our joy may be full. So that our joy will be complete. So he wants us to produce. That's the reason he, that's the reason he does a little uh, uh, whittling on us every once in a while. And he takes branches and he puts them back up on the trellis where they're supposed to go, get them out of the mud. He may prune something so that we can produce more. Why? Because the more we produce, the more joy we have. Why? Because he wants us to be joyful. Those people who are convinced that God wants us to be miserable are not reading the right Bible, okay? Get them, get them a different Bible. Say, no, no, read this Bible. This Bible actually tells you that the Lord wants me to be joyful. He wants that for me. Like a good father, he wants that for me. So how does this tie in with our humble Jesus? Well, in Philippians 2, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion... Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one person, on one purpose. Paul's encouragement to Timothy was that he have complete joy. That's what I want for you. That's what I hope you want for me and what you want for yourself and what you want for your family. And so how do we... How do we make joy? How do we increase joy? How do we turn our joy up? How, what, what fertilizer do we put in our life so that joy will grow faster and better and, and all that other stuff? I listened to a great, uh, a great teaching this week by Chris Vallotton. And uh, Chris is one of the teaching pastors uh, at Bethel in, in Reading. And um, he's doing this two-part series on uh, transforming your mind. And he said something really interesting. Jesus didn't come to change my, uh, my behavior. He came to transform my mind. And when I have a transformed mind, guess what happens to my behavior? It, it just changes. It just adjusts to him. And so, uh, so it, it was kind of cool. And, and he talks about different things. One of the things he talks about is how uh, neural paths in our brain, and, and I don't understand brain science, and I've only listened to the thing three times. So, uh, but, but one of the things he says about the, the brain science is that our brains, and I am living proof of this, our brains uh, want to work as little as possible. It, it makes a neural pathway, and that's going to travel that neural pathway, unless you create a different neural pathway. I mean, that's just what it does. When you guys leave here, how many of you are going to go the fastest way to your car from this room? You guys are? Which door are you going to go out? That one right there? Why not go through that one right there? That's closer. Why? Because that's not the way we go. That's not the way everybody goes. Everybody goes out that door. It's the neural pathway of the group. We all go that way. Nobody, you know, very few people go out that. Why? Because well, we didn't think about that. Because that would cost extra thinking. And everybody knows we don't want to do any extra thinking. I mean, that's, isn't that the, kind of the way? So in our spiritual life, we need to make sure that we have replaced old pathways with the, oh man, this is probably going to be horrible. I'm going to get called in. I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get that, which is a very much an orphan spirit kind of thing. Uh, there's no way this is going to turn out good. Just prepare yourself for the worst. Let's create some new pathways where, you know what? Wait a minute. My God shall supply all my needs. My God is greater. My God is the source of all authority. My God, boom, boom, boom. You know what? I'm going to walk into this meeting expecting it to be a good thing. That's, a, that's an option. Okay, Matthew chapter 13. In the parable of the sower. Um, when you became a Christian, the Spirit entered in, and one of his attributes is joy. Usually the happiest time of a, of a Christian is when? Is that when they're, be, they're just a fresh believer? 
man, they're excited. They're ready to, as they say, storm hell with a water pistol. They're just so pumped. And they come home and the first family get together and they want to tell everybody at the table, even the ones that they know don't care. They want to tell them about Jesus. And, and they're so excited. They're so, I mean, that joy is so pronounced. And, and it hasn't been beaten back by, you know, by, by uh, religious meaning people. Going, oh, you know, that, you're, you're getting a little carried away there. You need to just kind of calm that whole Jesus is the answer thing down and get, get real when that is actually the real. So anyways, when we look at the parable of the sower, what does it say? The one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Now I'm going to ask you to think back. Do you remember when you got saved? Do you remember that moment? Do you remember that that realization, that revelation, I was lost and now I'm found. I was blind and now I see. I was dead and now I'm alive. I was an enemy of God and now I'm a friend of God. That was joy. That joy came because of who you now are in relationship to the Father. No trial, no struggle, no sickness, no lack changes that. So you can always no, I can have that joy. Now look, you can be joyful and still have a, have a bad day, okay? <laughs> you can be joyful and still have somebody cut you off in traffic and you think, God love you, I'd like to, you know, you can... St-. But what we're talking about is that joy that sustains you through all this other stuff to where we deal with those things differently than people who do not have that. So... Um, so if you ever have said, this is going to be horrible, usually it turns out to be horrible. We know that our, our words are pretty powerful. And uh, so the, uh, the, the kids earlier, they could have chosen any of those, but, but they, you know, they, they explained part of the reason. And I think, again, like I said, a lot of the reason is they, they trust the guy who put the bag together. Do you trust the one who has put things together? Do we as a church trust that God is in control, that God is watching us, that God is guiding us? If God is good and I can trust him, then I can enter any situation knowing that he's gone ahead of me and that God has it under control. Years ago, uh, Sally did a a teaching, and it was called Move Your Butt. And uh, so for those of you who haven't heard this story, it's quite fun, especially how it ended up. I've got a, my God is big, but this situation is really going to be bigger. My God is big, but, but this thing looks, this situation, this sickness, this, this problem, it looks insurmountable. Or this situation looks pretty bad, but... My God is bigger. See how you move your butt there? Yeah. So later on, that very next Sunday, our pastor, which is Pastor Bruce, Pastor Bruce was a very prim and proper guy from Cincinnati, Ohio, mispronounced the word humble, said humble, always bothered me. But he said, but there's Sally, there's your butt. And just when he said that, you may as well just stop church right then because he was, you know, there's your butt, Sally. So I want to encourage you this week. Because you have the joy of the Lord, it's your strength. And he wants it to be complete in you. He wants to build it in you. That you need to start spiritually moving your butt. This situation looks bad, but my God shall supply all my needs. This situation looks tough, but my God is a loving father. This doesn't look good, but my God is greater. That is how our joy begins. You just stand in the the mirror and say that, and you'll notice you begin to get a little bit, a little bit lighter, a little bit happier, a little cocky. You're just kind of, yeah, man, this is good. That's the joy of the Lord bubbling up inside you. And it will grow if we will feed it. It will grow if we nourish it. It will grow if we exercise it. So there's a couple of people in uh, in our humble king birth story here um, who got pretty joyful. The first one we find in Luke chapter 1 uh, and uh, 43 and four, through 45. And you recognize the story. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me 
And this is, of course, Elizabeth, who is pregnant now, six months pregnant with John, the one who would go before Jesus, uh, the one who would, who would make the pathway straight, and he would proclaim the coming of, of the Messiah. Behold, when the sound of your greeting, when the sound of Mary's greeting reached Elizabeth's ear, the baby inside leapt in my womb for joy. Now, Leah, uh, Leah and Ben are expecting their third child. It's due um, in March. Uh, when, when's, uh, when's our next baby due? Two weeks. No, not our, and, and when's yours due? If I might ask, Tracy, I know that June, okay, all right. So, do moms like it when their babies move? How many of you moms realized, I just spent a half hour watching this, you know, I could actually take it with me, but I'm just going to sit here and watch it because. (laughs) But when the baby inside one woman is so powerful and so present that when she speaks and the other woman hears it and then the baby inside her reacts. Now, this is this this is all about when does life start, y'all? I mean, (laughs) there's, there's no doubt about it. Uh, because Jesus and, and John are only, you know, six months apart in, in, in age. There was a joy. There was so much joy in that little unborn baby that he leaps in his mother's womb. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Um, I know you guys have seen the cartoon. It's the cartoon of Batman and Robin that they use for those so many things where Batman is slapping Robin. Robin will say something, and then Batman will slap. And, and, and Robin is, in this one, he's saying, Mary, did you know? And Batman is slapping him and goes, yes, it's in Luke chapter 1. It's, she knew, you know, but she didn't know everything. Who's another group of people who are pretty joyful at the birth of this humble king? Luke chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born to you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And the shepherds go away, and they find this babe, and and it's a very joyful, very, very powerful thing. So baby Jesus, humble king who's come, remember he has all all authority. He, he, he's the Alpha and the Omega, but he humbled himself so that he could come and so that we could all be in, in the circle. We could all be welcome in. There's nobody. Look, shepherds and, and teenage girls, about the lowest on the totem pole that you could get in that day and time, and that's where Jesus decided to enter the picture. That's where he entered the fabric. So if he'd been born in a, in a, in a castle in, in, some, in some kingdom, if he'd been born in some uh, higher learning institution, if he'd been born in, in the richest of rich families, then people would go, well, you know, that's just for the rich people. That's just for the royalty. That's just for the, the in people. But he came and he humbled himself so that all of us know, there, so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> there, is, there is a chance. And his name is Jesus. So just as we are called to be carriers of hope, you're carriers, supposed to be carriers of hope, and just as you're supposed to be a carrier of peace, when you walk in a room, the peace level in the room should go up. You know, now, if your name is Peace All, it, it's, you know, it's, it's more expected. Peace to all, you know. But also, joy. You should be a carrier of joy. If you find that lately you've not been a carrier of joy, you've actually been a carrier of gloom, despair, and agony on me, okay? Turn off Hee Haw. No, actually, leave Hee Haw, and it's better than anything else that's on TV. But, but why, is it, why is your joy not being complete? Why are you struggling to be joyful? Could it be that you've forgotten who you are in Christ? Could it be that you really think God's not watching out for me? Could it be that you really are convinced that God's really not a good, good father? 
because the circumstance and the situation, the joy of the Lord. I want to encourage you this week to do that. And then another way, uh, and this is kind of a heart sink thing, and you know we